afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And the question one on health and well-being is from Bob Doris. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it meets the, the health needs Microphone. of asylum seekers. There's no we have always we have always been clear that uh, asylum seekers. Point of order, Mr. So, uh, Doris, point of order. So I don't mean to be contrary, and yes, of course, it's not a point of order. But the microphones in the chamber are not working. I wonder if that could be rectified. Indeed, is your is your is your microphone up? Yeah, no, it, it's lit, on. but it's not. Right. Right. OK, oh, thank you for that point of order, Mr. <laughs> and we now have action. Right, so I'll move to Michael Matheson, Minister. And did you hear Mr. Doris's question? Do you want him to repeat it? Uh, take two, uh, Deputy President <laughs> Officer. I'll, uh, what do you call? I heard his question. Um, we have always been clear that asylum seekers should be welcomed, supported and integrated into Scotland's communities from day one and have access to health services. NHS boards are required to ensure access to the health service uh, to meet the needs of individuals. We have been working uh, over the past year in partnership with COSLA and the Scottish Refugee Council uh, to develop a strategy for asylum seekers and refugee integration. Uh, the strategy, which will be launched next month, recognises the importance of good health and access to quality health care to be successfully integrated for the successful integration of refugees and asylum seekers. The strategy uh, will increase understanding of their rights and how to access them. Thank you very much. Mr Doris. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I would like to raise the specific issue of one of my constituents who is an asylum seeker. I know that uh, Mr Neil, the Cabinet Secretary, will be aware of the case. My constituent was taken off the kidney transplant list when he lost his uh, unsuccessful in his uh, asylum case, although there's legal moves pending, that automatically triggered that removal based on English NHS guidelines and not Scottish ones. However, my constituent has still not been put back on the NHS transplant list and the case has been peer reviewed by Lothian Health Board. Can I ask the Minister whether he's open minded to reviewing the treatment? of asylum seekers within the Scottish NHS to make sure that Scottish NHS boards are properly following the requirements to treat asylum seekers the same as any other Scots resident within our nation. Minister. Uh, well, there is already uh, guidance available for NHS boards which sets out very clearly that uh, those who are in Scotland as uh, asylum seekers should receive the same type of healthcare provision as any other uh, resident within uh, Scotland. Clearly, the issue which the member raised, which is previously uh, raised with the, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, uh, there is a matter where it's, uh, there's a clinical decisions that have to be made about whether someone should be put onto the transplant list. Uh, part of that is uh, not only the uh, clinical benefit they would get from a transplant, but also whether they are uh, able to uh, meet the treatment requirements following the transplant as uh, well. But if the uh, member has some uh, further specific information which he feels that uh, would be helpful in trying to address his constituents' concerns, I've got no doubt that you know, myself or the Cabinet Secretary would be more than happy to explore that with them uh, to ensure that the concerns of his constituent uh, are being properly addressed by NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Thank you. Question two, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing has had with the Minister for Housing and Welfare on food bank provision. Minister Michael Madison. Uh, both the Cabinet Secretary and myself hold regular meetings with uh, our ministerial colleagues, including the Minister for Housing and Welfare, Welfare on a range of issues uh, affecting the health and wellbeing of the Scottish people. Our discussions uh, have a focus on the most vulnerable groups in our society uh, and how we can help to tackle issues around health inequalities. Claire Baker. Uh, Minister, after recently visiting Dunfermline Food Bank, this week I have heard about increasing demand at the Leave and Mouth Food Bank. And while benefit changes and delays are seen as a key driver of this, volunteers are reporting that people with mental health issues are presenting themselves for this kind of support. And it was last week that the Scottish Government's own report on health inequalities showed that this had a bigger impact on mental well-being in areas of deprivation. Um, and that's where we see inequalities increasing. Now, we know that the Scottish Government has rolled back um, on some of the anti 
um, poverty programmes that were in place? And what plans does the Minister have to more effectively target resources to actually address health inequalities? Minister. Well, the first thing I'll do is I'll correct the member in that we haven't rolled back in any of our anti-poverty strategies. If anything, we've actually increased the range of anti-poverty strategies in order to try and tackle this issue. Uh, and it's important we keep this thing in context. Uh, the whole issue around the inequalities which we have in our society, particularly health inequalities we have in our society, are very much rooted in some of the social inequalities we have in our society, income inequality, uh, lack of opportunity, educational attainment, all of which feed into uh, causing these inequalities within our society. And what we need to do is to take concerted action in order to address them effectively. But like the member said that she had visited a, a, a food bank in her own uh, region, I've done the same in my own constituency. And the number one reason for individuals having to make use of the food bank in my constituency in Falkirk are delays in welfare payments due to the welfare system and the welfare reforms that are taking place. I believe the most effective way we can deal with these types of issues is to make sure this Parliament has the powers to manage the welfare system here in Scotland so we can tackle the root causes, the root causes of what is forcing people to use food banks rather than actually using food banks to mitigate the impact of the welfare system that has been ripped apart by their colleagues in the Better Together yeah, campaign. Yeah, yeah. Alex Johnson. Uh, thank you, the, the Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I have to tell the Minister that I disagree with the simplistic de uh, understanding he has of the need for food banks. I believe that the much more complicated situation is one we need to better understand. Will the Minister give an undertaking that the Government will uh, commission independent research into why there is an increasing demand for food banks in order to ensure that we do understand if it is more complicated than he represents? Minister. Well, I'm sure it's not lost in the member that there's a direct correlation between the increasing number of food banks we have in the country and the welfare changes that his government at Westminster are introducing, which is causing real difficulty and real crisis for many individuals across the country. And I'm sure he's no different uh, to me and other members within this chamber who have constituents who come to them on a weekly basis at their surgery, having difficulties with the changes that have been caused to the welfare system, delays in payments being made to them and forcing them to have to then go to food banks in order to get food in itself. Food poverty is on the increase in this country, not because of the inaction of this government here and the Scottish government, but because of the actions of the welfare, wel welfare changes being brought forward by the UK government and the impact that is directly having on people. And I would hope, I would hope that the member would recognise that we will do everything we can within our powers, but in order to deal with this effectively, we need to make sure that we have full control over the welfare system here in Scotland so we can affect the change that suits the people of Scotland more appropriately. Many thanks. Question three from Malcolm Chisholm has been withdrawn for understandable reasons. Question four, George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what opportunities there are for people with mobility issues to participate in viewing events during the Commonwealth Games in 2014 at Hampden Park. Mr Shona Robinson. The Glasgow 2014 Organising Committee is working to ensure that accessible seating and associated facilities are available for people with mobility issues at Commonwealth Games events. To that end, it is currently conducting accessibility audits at all competition venues to understand existing provision and identify areas for improvement. Accessibility improvements have already been made at Hamden. A new upgraded lift has been installed along with four new wheelchair accessible WCs and additional facilities for users with reduced mobility. For the Games, a temporary athletics track will be installed and the wheelchair viewing spaces will be temporarily relocated. George Adam. Thank the Minister for the answer. The Minister is obviously aware that there will be much welcome new viewing areas for fans with mobility issues during the Commonwealth Games. She may also be aware that it is only a temporary measure and many disabled fans who follow Scotland at the National Stadium currently only have a choice of trackside or restricted view. Does the Minister agree with me and the Scottish Disabled Supporters Association that this seating should be retained by Hampden Park and will she meet with me and the members of the SDSA regarding this issue? Minister. Um, can I say to the member that um, the organising committee has been working with all competition venues to try and ensure solutions uh, can be made on a, a permanent legacy basis wherever that is possible, although it is recognised that sometimes temporary solutions uh, will be necessary. However, I, what I would say to the member is that I do recognise that the Scottish Disabled Supporters Association is doing excellent work to ensure um, issues for their members are being raised and considered. 
And whilst the specific issues raised by the member are the responsibility of Hamden Park Limited, I would be happy to meet with the, the member and the association to discuss that further. Many thanks. Question five, Jane Baxter. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what role it considers health visitors have in making Scotland the best place in which to grow up. Minister Michael Matheson. Health visitors play a vital role in contributing to the health and well-being of children, young people and families through their focus on early intervention, prevention and provision of universal services. With other members of the multi-agency team, health visitors help ensure that the well-being of every child is at the heart of our public services and that families get the support they need when they need it. Jane Baxter. I thank the Minister for that answer. Further to the Scottish Government's commitment to fully fund local authorities for the delivery of the named person provisions of the Children and Young People's Bill, should the bill be passed, will the Scottish Government show equal commitment to children aged 0 to 5 by fully funding health boards to train, recruit and employ health visitors to deliver the named person role? Minister. Well, the uh, financial considerations around the Children and Young People's Bill are contained within the financial memorandum that sits alongside the bill itself, which the uh, Minister responsible for, the Minister for Children and Young People, uh, Aileen Campbell, has already uh, set out. Uh, clearly, there is an important role for health visitors to play as part of the named person uh, provisions that will be contained within that bill for those aged between uh, zero to uh, five. What we have done over the last number of years is to increase the number of health visitors in Scotland. So since 2007, the number of health visitors we have in Scotland has increased by some 13 uh, per cent, along with a 77 per cent increase in public health uh, nurses. Uh, what we intend to do is to make sure that we work closely with our boards to make sure that they have the capacity in place to allow the health visitors who will be responsible uh, as named individuals to be able to do so effectively and we expect our boards to put plans in place to make sure they do that in time for the bill coming into force. Thank you. Dr Annette Mill. Thank you. Does the Minister agree with me that uh, ideally health visitors uh, should be placed within general practice and in primary care as part of the team so they really are closely involved with families in a relatively small locality um, of their health board area? Minister. I think it's important to see health boards as being part of that multidisciplinary team, including the general practitioner, the other public health nurses and the other uh, health professionals who are engaged in working with uh, children, young people and uh, families. And, uh, one of the important aspects is to make sure that we continue to improve the education provision for health visitors. So, uh, uh, the National Education Scotland are already taking forward work to look at how we can improve the educational provision uh, for health visitors to allow them to continue uh, to make progress within their career. But they are a key part of that multidisciplinary team, uh, working with general practitioners, social workers, teachers, in order to make sure that we meet the needs of uh, children and young people effectively. Many thanks. Question six, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent measures NHS 5 has put in place to improve the Accident and Emergency Department at Victoria Hospital. Cabinet Secretary Alec Neil. Deputy Presiding Officer, NHS 5 appointed additional consultants to the Emergency Department in 2012 that enabled the introduction of a fast track process for the care of patients presenting to the emergency department with minor injuries. It also enabled extended consultant weekend working so that there is now weekend consultant working in the department from 9am till 11pm each day. Further consultants posts have now been approved for the emergency department which will further enable increased senior decision making across the 24 hour period. The redirection policy, which was introduced in May 2013, has resulted in the redirection of some patients who do not require the specific services that the emergency department provides to a more appropriate care setting, such as a GP practice. This allows patients who do, not, who do require the services which only A&E can provide faster access to treatment. Additional senior nurses have been recruited to the emergency department to provide additional resource to manage the patient's journey and to provide clinical leadership to the multidisciplinary team across the 24-hour period. David Torrance. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell you what steps the Scottish Government intend to take to ensure that the extra resources given to accident and emergency department at Victoria Hospital will have a positive impact on helping to reduce waiting times and in the long term offer a more effective and a higher level of care to the public. 
The presenting officer of the National Unscheduled Care Team have already established a robust performance framework to monitor NHS Board's delivery of improved and sustained performance across the whole system, including A&E waiting times. As part of the access to our additional £50 million, the Board submitted detailed local unscheduled care action plans, which detailed their approach, described how new service provision and personnel, which would positively impact on service quality and performance, and offered an improvement timeline that by month detailed progress would be delivered. From September, the unscheduled care team has established weekly and monthly performance protocols that review implementation of the local action plan and delivery of improved performance. There is a clear and explicit intervention and support system available that will be deployed where this agreed performance and or quality is not demonstrated to ensure boards are delivering effectively according to their plan and the national plan. Briefly, Claire Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will know that I recently wrote to him over concerns over the Victoria Hospital and patient care, and I thank him for the reply I received. Is he confident that following the concerns that are around A&E and the missed targets that have been in Fife, that they are in a robust position to go forward into the winter months and the challenges ahead? Presiding officer, I am confident they are in a much better position today than they have been previously, and that we are in constant contact with the NHS Fife to ensure week by week that their performance targets are being met, not just in terms of A&E turnaround times, but also the other performance targets, for example, in terms of the treatment time guarantee. Thanks. Question seven, Alex Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what the annual cost is of providing NHS service services for visitors and temporary migrants in Scotland. Minister Michael Matheson. It figures on the cost of overseas visitors and temporary migrants ac accessing NHS healthcare in Scotland are not held centrally. Overseas visitors are managed effectively in Scotland through a combination of regulation and Scottish Government guidance for NHS boards. Alex Johnson. I thank the Minister for his answer, but he will be aware that an independent report for the Department of Health estimated that the total cost of visitor and temporary migrants accessing the NHS services in England could be around £2 billion per annum. If we therefore extrapolate on the normal basis, it could be costing Scotland as much as £200 million a year. Will the, cabinet, uh, will the Minister undertake to um, immediately inquire into the cost in Scotland and how we might recover that money for the NHS? Minister. Well, I think it's very important that we uh, recognise the report that has been uh, uh, taken forward for the NHS in England. However, the situation in England in terms of a uh, number of migrants, etc., is very different to that of uh, Scotland. We view uh, migrants as being a, an important part of the Scottish economy and they are provided with health care provision in the same way that any other individual in Scotland is provided for as well. We have robust mechanisms in place uh, for those who do require to pay for NHS treatment if they are not uh, from Scotland uh, and that system is managed effectively by our boards. Uh, I think the figure which uh, the member made reference to is probably uh, uh, pretty excessive uh, because there is no evidence uh, of that level of expenditure here in Scotland whatsoever and there is no indication from any of our boards about particular difficulties which are being caused because, because as a result of uh, the number of uh, migrants who are making use of health care. What I think is important is that we uh, treat people on a, an equal and fair basis uh, while they are here in Scotland and we shouldn't start to use our health care system as a way of trying to manage immigration and migration in the country. Many thanks. Question 8, Jean Urquhart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its review of the regulatory framework that supports the community pharmacy applications process and the power that the NHS boards are given in relation to dispensing GP practices. Cabinet Secretary Alec Neill. Presiding Officer, the review which I announced in September is making steady progress and is nearing completion of its first stage. This involved identifying the full range of powers available across primary and secondary care legislation and how the framework could be better constructed to deliver the best possible outcome for patients and the NHS pharmaceutical care and primary medical services in rural communities. As part of this process, officials have identified a range of important and complex issues that will be central to the next stage of the review, leading to amended regulations. I expect to be able to announce shortly the next steps in taking this forward, including any consultation on the key issues identified. Jean Urquhart. 
I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. I know from previous exchanges in, in the Chamber that the Cabinet Secretary recognises the impact of opening community pharmacies on medical services in remote and island areas. I continue to receive correspondence from North Uist and Ben Bekina uh, regarding the current proposal there, and I, I wonder what further assurances the Cabinet Secretary can give those communities. Cabinet Sec. Officer, I'm very much familiar with the situation in Uist and indeed in other parts of Scotland, in particular rural Stirlingshire. I did explore the possibility of having a moratorium until my review was completed, but I do not have the legal powers to impose a moratorium. But had I had those legal powers, I would have used them. Thanks. Bruce Crawford. Uh, I thank the Bank Secretary for his answers already provided. Um, as the Cabinet Secretary is aware, I have already taken a very close interest in this issue regarding community pharmacies. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware that new applications have been made to open pharmacies in both Aberfoyle and Drummond? And therefore, there is understandable local concern about the potential impact that these uh, applications will have on existing uh, dispensing GV practices, as well as other pharmacy businesses operating in that area. Uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary has made very clear the position of the Government in regard to the moratorium. I wonder if the, the Cabinet Secretary recognises the importance of uh, going through this process uh, as quickly and, uh, and, 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 and uh, as we possibly can to ensure that any regulatory change that is required is brought before this Parliament at the earliest possible date. Cabinet Secretary. Mr. Officer, I totally agree with Bruce Crawford, and we're doing everything we can to make sure this progress is speedy, whilst, of course, adhering to uh, overall rules and guidelines in terms of consultation. Many thanks. And remembering time is of the essence. Rhoda Grant, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that Andrew Walker, who was a lay member of the Pharmacy Practice Committee in the Western Isles, has been asked to step down from that role when it became public that he was a lay member of that committee and also when he committed to listen to the concerns of the community on the application that was in hand. Surely this flies in the face of transparency, in, in the face of needing to consult and listen to views of those affected by decisions taken on their behalf. Can you maybe advise a uh, Western Isles Health Board how they should proceed with this and maybe give interim guidelines until he's in a position um, to come forward with a proper review. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, I am very much aware of the situation that uh, is described by Rhoda Grant. I need to be rather judicious in terms of any comments I make because of the potential implications, but I am keeping a very close eye on the situation and if the Western Isles Board requires my guidance uh, and if they ask for any guidance, I would be happy to provide it. Any thanks. Question 9, Stuart McMillan. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with the medical profession regarding the casework of GPs. Thanks. Cabinet Secretary, Alec Neil. Presiding officer, Scottish ministers are fully committed to working with general practice professionals to ensure that the framework within which primary care is delivered is fit for purpose and responsive both to local circumstances and patient need. The Scottish Government is in regular dialogue with the Scottish General Practitioners Committee on these and other important issues affecting patient care and service delivery. Freeing up GP time spent on bureaucracy to enable that time to be spent on patient care remains a priority for this Government in the development of a more Scottish contract and something which we wish to explore with the SGPC at every opportunity. Thank you. Stuart McMillan. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the response. Uh, and in response to question S4W16841, uh, I wrote to the BMA Scotland questioning the impact uh, on GPs of the UK Government's welfare reforms. In the response I received, BMA Scotland indicated that anecdotally, the UK Government's welfare reforms are increasing GPs' workloads as patients are very concerned and confused about health assessments they are being forced to take. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my concerns that the welfare reforms from Westminster are having a damning and detrimental effect on the most vulnerable in society? Does he also agree with me that we need to continue to campaign against such reforms? And finally, will he agree that with a yes vote next year, Scotland can have a welfare system that aids our peoples as compared to one that punishes those who are less well off or disabled? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, I agree with all yeah. these points that Stuart McMillan makes. 
the UK government's damaging cuts started under Labour being continued by the Coalition yeah, yeah, Government yeah, yeah. and challenges to the welfare system could potentially reduce benefit expenditure in Scotland <laughs> by over £4.5 billion in the five years to 2015, impacting on some of the most vulnerable in our communities, including women, children and disabled people. We are doing all we can to mitigate the impacts of these cuts where possible. However, we can only do so much within our existing powers and strapped resources. The solution is for the Scottish Parliament to have full control over welfare so that it can put in place policies which benefit the people of Scotland. And meantime, we continue to press the UK Government for fairer reform and to ensure that safeguards are in place for those who need them whilst doing what we can to help. Those affected. Many thanks. Supplementary from Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I know that the Cabinet Secretary is aware that there are many, many things that impact on the workload and caseload of, of GPs, but I would draw his attention to current difficulties there are in NHS Lanarkshire about waiting times. And does he recognise and understand that this causes great frustration for GPs? Um, because of the, the backlog that they can build up and because of their inability, as they see it, to be able to get the best service for their patients? And does he agree that the, the current review by Health Improvement Scotland um, could also look at the impact on GPs, perhaps, and thus look at health care holistically for people in Lanarkshire? Presiding officer, I'm very much aware of the issues that uh, Linda Fabiani quite rightly draws attention to, and indeed I have a meeting later today with the chair of NHS Lanarkshire, where again I'll be highlighting these issues and working together with NHS Lanarkshire to try to address the issues both in relation to the pressures on GP surgeries, but also in relation to the wider issues which are currently being addressed by the review being undertaken by Healthcare uh, Scotland. Thanks. Tavish Scott. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Would the Cabinet Secretary recognise that GPs referring cancer patients to the ARI in Aberdeen for radiotherapy are concerned by the lack of specialist oncology services in Aberdeen and specialist staff? Does he recognise that patients travelling from Shetland otherwise have to go uh, to an hour of being referred to other hospitals across Scotland? And would he undertake to discuss with uh, NHS Grampian how best to avoid that in the very trying circumstances that patients are now finding themselves in, which is of great concern to GPs locally? Locally, uh, where there is a considerable need to have those patients treated as quickly as possible, and particularly at the ARI in Aberdeen. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, the Member raises a very legitimate question. I am aware of the particular uh, challenges in the Grampian area, particularly in oncology and particularly in collectoral cancer, uh, where there is a particular uh, challenge. And we are working with the clinicians and indeed with the boards. Uh, to address these issues, and where necessary, we will continue to offer alternative sites for treatment for patients from Shetland and indeed from Orkney. But of course, the main issue is to address the challenges, which are not confined to that part of the country, but are part of a general shortage of some of these oncology skills right across the UK. Many thanks, Neil Finlay. Uh, yesterday, I welcomed the Cabinet Secretary's announcement that there is to be a new GP contract and, indeed, uh, a review of access to GP practices. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if today he will uh, give us a response to a request um, to convene all party talks on these two very important issues? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, I am always delighted to meet other parties, particularly when they have something positive to contribute. <laughs> so I do look forward to the positive contribution from Neil Finlay uh, as a new departure from previous contributions. Many thanks. Question 10, Annette Milne. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government for progress it is making on developing a new stroke care action plan. Mr Michael Matheson. Our Better Heart Disease and Stroke Care Action Plan is backed by over a million pounds of Scottish Government funding each year. It is aimed at ensuring people with stroke are able to access effective, safe and person-centred care as quickly as possible. Uh, the priorities set out within this action plan are monitored and updated annu annually uh, and approved by the National Advisory Committee for Stroke. Annette Milne. Thank the Minister for his answer, but would he agree with me that more needs to be done to ensure that stroke survivors have adequate access to psychological services, including clinical psychology services and stroke units, and psychological support in the community, as set out in the original action plan? 
Can you tell me the extent to which this support is available in the community and how many stroke units provide clinical psychology services? Minister. I, I know that there has been a, a, an issue around being able to get access to psychological therapies for uh, patients who have experienced a, a stroke. And one of the actions we have been taking forward as part of our wider mental health strategy is to increase the availability of psychological therapies. That is why there has been an increase in the number of psychologists uh, and other therapies being made available uh, within the NHS. What we want to do is to make sure that we continue to increase capacity within this area. That is why we have brought forward the heat target for access to psychological therapies therapies in order to make sure that boards are being more consistent in availability of these services. And with the uh, heat target coming into force as of the end of 2014, it will ensure that all boards are putting in place the necessary measures to ensure that they have psychologists and other talking therapies available within their board area, including for patients who suffer stroke. Okay, thanks. Dennis Robertson. Yeah, uh, to ask the Minister, uh, what measures can be taken to encourage more uh, blood pressure testing in the workplace and in the wider community, including community pharmacies, uh, as a preventative measure for, stroke, pre preventative measure for strokes? Minister. Well, there is no doubt that uh, having your blood pressure checked on a regular basis is an important element in helping to reduce individuals from experiencing a, a stroke. I am aware uh, that the uh, Stroke Association uh, in January of uh, 2014 will be running the uh, Know Your Blood Pressure campaign, which we are more than happy uh, to support them with, uh, which will allow them to take that campaign into community uh, pharmacies to encourage people to uh, get their blood pressure taken. Alongside that, uh, we continue to have within the GP contract provisions to make sure that general practitioners uh, are also uh, taking uh, patients' blood pressure uh, uh, for those patients who are at greatest risk um, of uh, heart disease, stroke and hypertension. Uh, but we are also taking forward work in terms of within the workplace uh, through the uh, Scottish Centre for Healthy Working Lives, which we provide support for, which will assist employers uh, and in workplaces in general to help to promote good health and wellbeing uh, for their workforce. And the centre will support those uh, companies and individuals uh, to look at issues such as uh, checking blood pressure amongst their uh, workforce on a regular basis. Many thanks. Dr Lane Murray. Place to address seasonal pressures on health services in Dumfries and Galloway. Cabinet Secretary Alec Neil. Presiding officer, all health boards have plans in place to ensure the quality and continuity of local health services during the winter period. NHS Dumfries and Galloway's winter plan was endorsed at their October health board meeting and is available on their website. These plans are informed by national guidance, such as preparing for winter 2013-14, which was issued to all health boards on the 27th of September, and supported by additional Scottish Government investment, such as the £50 million Unscheduled Care Action Plan announced on the 25th of February to improve A&E performance over the next three years. Dr. Murray. The Cabinet Secretary for his reply. Uh, wards in Dumfries and Galloway Royal Infirmary were closed on five separate occasions due to outbreaks of norovirus in 2012-13, according to the annual review of NHS Dumfries and Galloway, and two wards have had to be closed just last month due to another outbreak. Does the Health Secretary intend to make further guidance regarding the prevention of the introduction of viral infections to hospitals from the community and their spread within hospitals? And does he recommend restrictions on visitor numbers and visiting times when these infections are circulating? within the wider community. Cabinet Secretary. Planning officer, already, whenever there is an outbreak of such a virus, there are uh, limitations placed on visitors and, of course, on uh, the availability of particular wards. But can I say, as part of our unscheduled care plan, every board has been asked to prepare contingencies in the event of uh, something like norovirus breaking out and wards having to be closed because the knock-on impact is on patients, on visitors and indeed on staff. And one of the particular challenges we faced last year from norovirus was, first of all, it started earlier than usual. And secondly, as well as impacting on wards and patients, uh, quite a number of staff went off sick because they themselves had, con had contacted norovirus. So very clearly what we are saying to all the health boards is in terms of wards and bed availability, in terms of staffing, in terms of all the other aspects of dealing with the outbreak of any virus, including norovirus, these contingency plans should be in place. So if you do have an outbreak, you immediately implement the contingency plan. Thanks. Question 12, Jamie Hepburn. 
what impact the abolition of prescription charges will have over this coming winter. Cabinet Secretary Alec Neill. Presiding officer, the abolition of prescription charges has removed a barrier to good health for many people across Scotland, particularly those on low incomes or those with long-term conditions. Taking the prescriptions they need without the worry of cost will help to keep these people well over the winter months. May happen. Uh, President Officer, the UK Shadow Health Secretary recently told Holyrood Magazine that you want to see health policies that can be consistent across England, Scotland and Wales, saying wouldn't that be a good thing pulling in the same direction? Does the Minister agree with me that given that Labour at Westminster have shown new enthusiasm for free prescriptions and given that nothing is off the table with Joanne Lamont's Cuts Commission, wouldn't Andy Burnham's formula in the circumstances that Labour and Government threaten free prescriptions in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I remind the member that Andy Burnham, when he was the Health Minister in England, was the Health Minister that introduced the £20 billion worth of cuts in the health service down south that has been taken forward by the Coalition Government and, of course, was very enthusiastic about privatisation of certain aspects of the health service. And certainly, I think the last thing the people of Scotland need is the re-imposition of prescription charges at £7.85 for a single prescription or £104 for an annual prepayment certificate. And I look forward to the report of the Cuts Commission uh, by the Labour Party in Scotland to see if they are going to reimpose these Point prescription charges. Point of order charges. for Mr Finlay. President, officer, I was under the impression that question time was about the responsibilities of the government, not the responsibilities of anyone else. I wonder Many if you thanks. could rule on that, President. As Mr Finlay will be well aware, that's not a point of order. You've made your point nonetheless. Um, <laughs> Cabinet Secretary, were you finished in your response? <laughs> Cabinet Secretary, were you finished in your response? I take it you were. Supplementary from Je Jenny Mara. Thank you, President Officer. Would the Cabinet Secretary consider taking his ban off of advertising free prescriptions for minor ailments to those most in need in our society, single mothers on benefits, who could actually get a cough bottle for their children, who really need these prescriptions over the summer, but his government currently has a ban on advertising this service to those in need? Cabinet Secretary. I think that's a total misrepresentation of the situation, as you come to expect from Jenny Barra. Thank you. Question 13 has been withdrawn and an explanation has been provided. Question 14, Christian Allard. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has received assurances from NHS Grampian that it will act swiftly on the Healthcare Environment Inspectorate's recommendations following its inspection of Aberdeen Maternity Hospital. Secretary Alec Neill. Presiding officer, NHS Grampian has already put in place an improvement action plan addressing the issues raised by the recent very unsatisfactory HEI inspection at Aberdeen Maternity Hospital. The chief executive has been required to take personal responsibility for delivery of the plan and the board will be held to account against this. The HEI will undertake further announced and unannounced inspections in order to ensure there is robust evidence of progress against the actions identified. NHS Grampian has stated publicly in its media release on the 30th of October that all the issues raised in the report have been tackled as a matter of urgency and all of the requirements and recommendations are being addressed. It has also stated that most of the actions have already been completed and the remainder are at an advanced stage of implementation. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Constituents I represent in the North East, patients and parents of newborn babies, deserve to have confidence in the cleanliness of wards and the quality of their care. Can the Cabinet Secretary say which agencies of the Scottish Government have been tasked with supporting NHS Grampian in improving its standards. Thank you. Last week at the Scottish Government's instruction, Health Protection Scotland visited Aberdeen Maternity Hospital to determine how these failures occurred, to coordinate support for NHS Grampian, to quickly rectify the problems identified and to ensure the systems are put in place by NHS Grampian so that these events are never repeated. Uh, Health Protection Scotland will coordinate support from other national agencies as necessary, including Healthcare Improvement Scotland, Health Facilities Scotland, NHS Education for Scotland and the Information Services Division. 
And a brief supplementary from Richard Baker, please. Final. Thank you. Is it not the case that they need to upgrade maternity services at NHS Grampian have contributed to this problem? And what action is the Cabinet Secretary taking to ensure that the Health Board has the resources and support it needs to put in place the much needed new maternity facilities at the hospital? Presiding officer, let me make it absolutely clear that there is no reason why what was discovered by the healthcare inspectorate, there is no excuse for that happening in any hospital, no matter what the age of the hospital. And certainly in Aberdeen maternity, as Grampian have accepted, what was found was unacceptable. There is an issue, as the member knows, going forward in terms of the capital programme for either upgrade or replacement of Aberdeen Maternity Hospital. And when we receive detailed proposals on that, they will be given due consideration. Of course, it would be easier to confirm uh, this capital programme if our capital programme overall had not been cut by 26% this coming year. Many thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions. And we now